1969, the hippie counterculture was reaching new heights on a farm near Woodstock, New York. The message was love, and the mood was fueled by the energy and the ideals of the late 60s. But across the country, fear reigned in Hollywood, California. Actress Sharon Tate, eight months pregnant, had been brutally murdered along with four others at an isolated estate. All I can tell you right now is that uh, we've got uh, five uh, dead people, and we're trying to determine uh, who caused their death. And 24 hours later, a second slaying, a middle-aged couple named Lino and Rosemary LaBianca were knifed to death inside their own home. The unknown killers left bloody graffiti at both scenes. When the arrest finally came down, the city was stunned. The killers were young, with all American looks. One man, 24-year-old Charles Tex Watson, and three women, 20-year-old Leslie Van Houten, 21-year-old Patricia Krenwinkel, and 21-year-old Susan Atkins. They could have been the girls next door. Yet, their devotion to an ex-convict named Charles Manson was so extreme, it led them to murder. It was the first real cult. And these were the first cult killings we knew of in this country. The very thought of these young women dressed in black, armed with sharp knives, entering the homes of complete strangers in the middle of the night and mercilessly stabbing them to death. I mean, it's so horrendous a thought that it's difficult to keep a thought like that in your mind for a couple moments. At trial, the girls, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten, seemed not only willing to kill, but to die for Charles Manson. Charlie would always say, these are your children, and you threw them out, and I took them in. They were the children of America, but he perverted them and corrupted them, and they became something else. Charles Manson began life on the wrong side of the tracks and spent the next 35 years there, in and out of prison, for crimes like forgery and pimping. But the most notorious of the Manson girls who killed, Patricia Krenwinkel, Susan Atkins, and Leslie Van Houten, were children of the middle class. On the surface, they led comfortable lives in California's sprawling post-war suburbs. Leslie Van Houten was born in 1949, the second of four children. She was especially close to her father, Paul, an automobile auctioneer. She was very happy and outgoing and uh, very athletic. And she seemed to enjoy life. She just was uh, sometime without care and abandon, I would say. She did break her arm a couple times just by being energetic and being really into the whatever she was doing. She was from a very upstanding family in Monrovia, California. She was a homecoming princess. She was always very, very pretty and very bright. Patricia Krenwinkel grew up in the Los Angeles suburb of Westchester. She was the daughter of an insurance agent and a homemaker. Pat was a darn good kid. Didn't complain about anything. No matter where I took her, I never had one bit of trouble with Pat. Then something happened that left both girls feeling alienated and angry. By the time they were in high school, Leslie's and Patricia's parents were both divorced. During the time I was brought up, nothing was talked about. I mean, my parents' dissolution of their marriage. You don't talk about that. You don't talk about problems in the home. I believe that I was desperately seeking someone that I could love and hold on to and call my own that somehow my dad leaving had left a space there. I was very close to my father, and there was a hole when he left. Both girls began drowning their pain in alcohol and drugs. When I was about 15 years old, I began using drugs. And something happens when you use drugs. You begin to find people who, like yourself, use drugs. Meanwhile, as a teenager in Northern California, Susan Atkins chose outright rebellion. She dropped out of high school and found work as a topless dancer in San Francisco. Susan Atkins was probably the most deprived of all of the women that followed Manson. Her mother 
died while she was a young teenager. Her mother had cancer. And they told stories about how Susan brought all her friends on Christmas to sing carols under her mother's room at the hospital. She was very affected by the loss of her mother. 1967, the summer of love. For all three girls, Leslie, Pat, and Susan, it was their summer of looking for love. Their search took them straight to San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury. By then, 32-year-old ex-pimp Charles Manson was exploring the same streets. Another Manson follower, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, never actually killed for him, but she became one of his earliest followers. Young Lynette's childhood in Los Angeles was overshadowed by her parents' poor relationship. She was quiet and sensitive, but her talents in dancing, drama, and poetry frequently put her center stage. In junior high, Lynette's classmates voted her personality plus. She came from post-war suburbia, except that this was post-war suburbia uh, in the backyard of Hollywood. She dated a guy named Bill Siddons, who went on to a manager group called The Doors. She was someone who was extremely familiar with media culture and celebrity culture as just an ordinary, average, expected part of growing up. Although Lynette Fromm was talented, it became clear that she was also troubled. By senior year, her attendance at Redondo Union High School had become sporadic. At an after-school job, she found a frightening way to express her pent-up emotions. Several of her friends who were working were in the shop remember this evening where she took the staple gun and just shot up her arm methodically and uh, didn't flinch at all. Those who knew Lynette speculated that abusive treatment by her father lay at the root of her pain. The Fromm household had never been warm, but when Lynette was a teenager, her father suddenly stopped speaking to her for three years while living under the same roof. Her father just decided she was not worth talking to anymore, and he decided to exclude her from his life. She wasn't even 100% clear why. She spoke to her mother if something had to come from her father, she spoke to her mother, and her mother asked her father and then answered Lynn. I mean, you imagine being 13 years old and not being able to talk to your father. On the streets, it was a time of sexual exploration and experimentation with drugs, especially LSD, which was still legal in the 60s. It was just what Charles Manson was looking for. Manson had come out of prison and wound up in Haight-Ashbury and a girl came up to him in the street, handed him a flower, and said, love. And he thought, ooh, something's going on here. He'd been in prison for a while, and there was this whole new movement. And he grabbed onto it and ran with it. In 1967, Charles Manson recruited the first member of his hippie family, a Berkeley librarian named Mary Bruner. At 19, Lynette Fromm dropped out of El Camino Community College and became the second. She was said she was sitting on a curb in Venice, California. Her parents had thrown her out. And she said that this bus drove up. And this man got out, and he looked at her, and he said, your parents threw you out, didn't they? And she thought he was a genius and a psychic and everything else. She said, how did you know that? And she got into the bus with him, and she never came back. He, wait he waited for you know, 30 seconds or so, and he said, I, I can't make up your mind for you. And he just, he said goodbye, and he left. <laughs> he got about, nah, halfway down the block, and I just grabbed everything, and I ran. In Manson, Lynette Squeaky Fromm finally found a father figure. She would prove useful to him in managing his rapidly expanding family. Manson's real talent was that he recruited very young girls, very young and very impressionable, at a time in their lives when they had identity problems and they, had, they didn't know where they were going in society. And society was very strange right then. For the Manson girls, life outside of society would soon take a strange, hallucinatory turn as they fell under Charles Manson's power. By 1968, Charles Manson's hippie family had grown to a core of about 25 young people. They settled on an abandoned movie set outside of Los Angeles called Spawn Ranch, 
and shared everything from sex to hallucinogenic drugs. Leslie Van Houten, Patricia Krenwinkel, Susan Atkins, and Lynette Squeaky Fromm were disillusioned with their middle-class upbringing and searching for something better. They thought they'd found it in Charles Manson. As twisted as it all got, you know, I really think that I felt that I had met someone that by being around him would have a positive change. He actually would forget our names sometimes, but it wasn't an insult because his, uh, his love was without a doubt. And uh, it just so happened that we hooked into something that was true. First, there was love. It's a kind of love where, you know, you could actually be next to people who are making love and not think too much about it. There was a real close relationship to most of the members of the family. There was a lot of love there before there was fear and death and murder. It was a time of spiritual exploration, and even celebrities were looking for gurus. The Manson family had attracted visits from Jim Morrison of The Doors and Cass Elliott of The Mamas and Papas. For a few weeks, the family camped out at Beach Boy Dennis Wilson's house. Dennis goes out for a recording session, and he comes back at about 2 in the morning, and Manson greets him at the front door. And Manson gets down on his knees and kisses Wilson's feet and invites Wilson into Wilson's own home. Through Dennis Wilson, Manson met record producer Terry Melcher, the son of Doris Day, and even visited Melcher's estate on Cielo Drive. That estate would later be leased to a young actress named Sharon Tate and her husband, the film director Roman Polanski. But for the young women in Manson's family, their guru was more than just a way to meet the stars. He had a way of preaching to them. He would say things like, man invented time. There was never time before man invented it. And they would say, oh, oh, he's brilliant. He came up with this. You know, they were kids. But it sounded very profound to them. And they became dedicated to him. They absolutely followed him. For Squeaky, Spawn Ranch and the other Manson family haunts felt more like home than anywhere else she'd lived. Her experience traveling with Manson and being part of that group was so much better than living in this dreary, frightening household in the suburbs, being treated uh, uh, as, a, as a wrongdoer by her father. For her, her life improved tremendously when she joined this group. And at first, life on the ranch was not so different from other counterculture communes. It meant taking countless acid trips together and experimenting with group sex. But in the era of free love, Manson was using sex and drugs to control and dominate. He basically slept with whoever, you know, you either told to or wanted to. You know, our bodies weren't our own. He'd go on trips with them all the time, either taking no LSD himself or a smaller dosage than they would so he could retain more control over his mental faculties. And he'd dig down deep into their psyche during these trips and try to remove many of their convictions on life. To Barbara Hoyt, a 17-year-old runaway, life in the Manson family seemed like an eye-opening game, and the goal was to distort reality. Life at Spawn's Ranch was a quote-unquote magical mystery tour. Every day was a different thing. We dressed different, we played different, we lived on a movie set. And one thing we didn't have is watches, and the whole idea was to let time disappear. There was no time. We were all living now. Everybody had a role. Leslie was one of Manson's front street girls, the prettier women he used to attract men. Squeaky was the Manson family's den mother. She was very supportive to all of us. Uh, people in the family, she was a little bit maternal in how I related to her. Um, she was a very nice, loving person. <laughs> You'd never know. <laughs> and Quiet Pat was a good soldier. She helped keep everybody in line. When everyone else became jumpy or they became nervous or something started going wrong and they were thinking, maybe this isn't where I want to be, well, then you can take them to me because I would make them somehow feel all right. 
Volatile Susan Atkins, nicknamed Sadie, blindly and enthusiastically followed Charlie. Charlie would say something like to Sadie, go get me a coconut and I don't care if you have to go clear to Jamaica to do it. And she'd get up and she'd start out the door and he'd say, never mind. And she would have done it. She would have gotten clear to Jamaica. She had to to get him a fresh coconut. By the summer of 1969, Charles Tex Watson, one of Manson's few male followers, was giving the girls murder lessons under Manson's command. At first, it seemed like just another game. He demonstrated how to stab a person. He told us, don't just stick the knife in and out. He said, bring it up when you cut someone so that you cut up more stuff. Uh, um, and he made us practice. Slowly, the mood turned to paranoia. Increasingly, a common goal emerged, giving up individual ego to take on Manson's will. The family listened as he compared himself to Jesus Christ and the devil. Sometimes he would reenact the crucifixion when we were on LSD, and it was very realistic and hard to, it was hard to watch. You had them thinking you were Jesus Christ. Really? How did you do that? Just being myself. All men are Jesus Christ. They are? Sure. Manson also began to ask for bizarre tests of devotion. I'd stand up against a tree and he'd throw knives at me. He'd throw hatchets at people. Do you trust me? Do you love me enough? You know, stand up against that tree. And he asked us constantly, each one of us, you know, will you die for me? Will you be my finger on a hand? Will you, you know, will you be me? So, did you want to be like him? Uh-huh. Yeah. Did all of you want to be like him? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Manson's talk was growing darker, and he claimed an apocalyptic racial revolution was at hand. He called it Helter Skelter after the Beatles song. He said the race riots and black militancy of the 60s were just the beginning. According to Manson, Helter Skelter would clear the way for the family to run the country. But as the summer of 1969 wore on, Manson became convinced they would have to ignite it themselves. We started to have a lot more guns at the ranch and knives, and people were on lookouts. We were pretty much all running on definite fear. The first Manson family murder took place in late July, 1969. The victim was a musician named Gary Hinman. The killers were people Hinman knew, family members Susan Atkins, Bobby Beausoleil, and Manson himself. It was Manson who sliced off Hinman's ear, and Bobby who stabbed him to death. I had to take the gun away from the guy, and the guy shot off on the wall, and I cut his ear off, and I took the gun, and I gave it to the kid. I said, here. I said, now I gotta kill this fool. He said, oh, don't kill me, don't kill me. I said, all right, are you going to tell the pro officer I cut your ear off? He said, no. And Bobby killed him and stabbed him in the heart, and he died. There's your heart, girl. There's your heart, Frenchie. There's your wine, Beausoleil. Susan Atkins left a gruesome signature. On the walls of Hinman's home, she scrawled the words, political piggy, in his blood. When he was found, no one knew the murder of this anonymous hippie was just a dress rehearsal for what would come 10 days later. August 8, 1969, began like any other day at Spahn Ranch outside Los Angeles. By now, Charles Manson and his family were looking less like a hippie commune and more like a bloodthirsty cult. Some members had already committed one murder in the name of Helter Skelter, a music teacher named Gary Hinman. Now Manson made it clear there would have to be another, more shocking crime. Harley came and woke me up, and he said, get up, I want you to go somewhere. Manson also rounded up three other family members, Charles Tex Watson, Susan Sadie Atkins, and Linda Kasabian. He said, get in the car, and he said, do everything the Tex says. And we were off. Former family member Barbara Hoyt remembers that night as the night that Susan Atkins asked her to run a special errand. 
Charlie was there and he wanted to know why it was there and I said because Sadie had called the back of the ranch and wanted three sets of dark clothes and he said they already left. Charlie didn't explain where they went but Barbara heard it from a ranch hand. He had asked Sadie where are you guys going and she leaned out of the car window and said we're gonna go kill some other epping pigs. The group was headed to Los Angeles to the home of a record producer Manson once visited. Now an actress named Sharon Tate was living there. She was eight months pregnant. Her husband, film director Roman Polanski, was out of the country, and she was hosting three house guests, Hollywood hairdresser Jay Sebring, coffee heiress Abigail Folger, and her Polish boyfriend, Wojtek Frakowski. Manson told Tex to kill everybody there, and Pat says her instructions were just as clear. He told me to do whatever Tex said. And I understand, and I believe Tex when he said Charlie told him to do it. While Linda Kasabian waited, Tex Watson led Susan Atkins and Patricia Krenwinkel onto the estate. Leaping over the wall, Tex surprised 18-year-old Stephen Parent, a friend of the groundskeeper who was just about to leave. Before he could, Tex reached into his car and shot him four times, point blank. Inside, Tex and the women herded everybody into the living room. Jay Sebring was the next to die. When he tried to protect Sharon, Tex shot and stabbed him. Frakowski was killed trying to escape, stabbed, bludgeoned, and shot by Tex. Abigail Folger also tried to flee in vain. At that point in time, I left and followed her. I ran after her with an upraised knife and we went out through a um, back door out onto the lawn. And I started stabbing her. I, I, I ran her down, and I began to stab her. I remember her saying, I'm already dead. Inside, Susan Atkins guarded a terrified Sharon Tate, who was bound around the neck and strung from the rafters. Atkins later told the story to Virginia Graham, a cellmate in jail. She said Sharon was crying and begging, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. I just want to have my baby. God, please don't kill me. And she says, and I looked her dead in the eye, and I said to her, bitch, I don't care about you or your baby, and you're going to die. And she said, and I killed her. By the time they were done, it was well after midnight, and five people were dead. They'd been stabbed more than 100 times. Why do you think he chose you for that night? Because he knew I wouldn't question him. But he's got about 25 people to choose from, right? He knew them better than you and I. Why did he choose these particular ones to go along with him? Well, my, my guess is he felt they were the ones that were most capable of committing these murders for him. The next night, Manson tapped the same group plus Leslie Van Houten. She was eager to prove her loyalty. He asked me, do you, do you believe enough in what I say to know that this is something that has to be done or something to that effect? And I said, yes, I do. This time, Manson drove the group to Los Angeles. The house he chose belonged to supermarket owner Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary. Manson walked in first. Seen uh, a guy sitting on the couch. When he was sitting on the couch, I was petting the dog. I said, hey, look like Sophia Lauren there. And I laughed at it. He said, hi. I said, hi. Manson bound and gagged them both, then left. I told the other dudes, I'll see you later, man. You know, like, I'll catch it on the run, man. I'm gone, man. And I split, man. Although he denied giving the command to kill, Tex and the women say it's a lie. While Tex stabbed Lino LaBianca to death in the living room, Pat and Leslie guarded his wife in the bedroom. I did have a knife, um, and I did a attempt to stab her. Basically, we gave up very quickly at that, and we went and got Tex. 
And then Tex turned me around and handed me the knife and he said, do something. Because Manson had told him to make sure that all of us got our hands dirty. And um, I stabbed Mrs. LaBianca in the lower back about 16 times. I went and Mr. LaBianca was already dead and I had gotten a fork and I stabbed him with a fork repeatedly and eventually left the fork in him. And then I wrote um, words all over the house in Skelter. blood. The words were helter skelter, rise and death to pigs. Words Manson had taken from the Beatles' White Album to describe his bloody vision of apocalypse. Now, eight people were dead, and three of Manson's all-American girls, Pat, Leslie, and Susan, were killers. Oddly, one family member was notably absent from both nights of murder, Charlie's right hand, Lynette Squeaky Fromm. Some people say it's because Charlie knew that she really wasn't capable of this kind of violent mayhem, and she didn't have what it took to plunge a, a knife in, into somebody. It's a, a very difficult thing to imagine doing. And, but I still believe that they were right because they felt right. They felt that despite the ugliness of it, it was the right thing to do. One thing was clear. The mastermind behind the murders had made sure that Tex and the women all bloodied their hands while he kept his own hands clean. I did stay clear of everything. But, you, but they say you didn't because they were acting for you on your instructions. No, no. That's, and under your influence. Well, maybe influence, maybe influence, and they might have thought it was my instructions. But I wasn't, I wasn't uh, directing traffic, lady. Back at Spawn Ranch, the Manson tribe waited for the Black Uprising, Helter Skelter, to come down. But what came down instead was the law. On August 16th, just one week after the Tate murders, the Los Angeles County Sheriff raided the family's compound. But the authorities were looking for stolen dune buggies, not murderers. And they released the Manson family just 48 hours later. They were free to commit yet one more murder. This time, it happened right at home on Spawn Ranch. The sounds woke 17-year-old Barbara Hoyt from her sleep. I heard the screams, and as he screamed and screamed and screamed and screamed, it went on forever. It was horrible, gut-wrenching screams I've never heard like that before in my life. Barbara recognized the screams. They belonged to a ranch hand named Shorty Shea. Fearing for her own life, Barbara made her escape from the Manson family. The identities of the Tate LaBianca killers were still unknown to the world, but that would soon change. November 1969. For four months, the mysterious slayings of actress Sharon Tate and six others had gone unsolved. What the authorities didn't know was that one of Tate's killers, 20-year-old Susan Sadie Atkins, was already sitting in a Los Angeles County jail charged with the murder of Gary Hinman. I noticed her only because she was happy and running around and dancing and singing. And I can remember thinking, this is really not the place for this kind of joy. Atkins' friendship with Virginia Graham would break the case wide open. They shared a dorm in jail. And it wasn't long before Susan confided that she'd been involved in another bigger crime, the notorious Tate LaBianca killings. Sadie had another shocking revelation. The other killers were hiding in the desert. And if they could help it, the Tate LaBianca murders wouldn't be their last. Graham felt responsible and tipped off the authorities. On her tip, the police rounded up the rest of the killers. Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Linda Kasabian, Tex Watson and Charles Manson. In December of 1969, they were all charged with murder. The trial of Manson and the girls, Pat, Susan, and Leslie, went forward in June 1970 without Tex Watson, 
who was fighting extradition from his home state of Texas. In exchange for her testimony, all of the charges were dropped against Linda Kasabian. She indicted all of them. She said that they had gone out, that they had instructions from Manson, that they were told to wear creepy crawlies, which were their black outfits, and that they were bent on murder. For almost a year, Manson played right into the prosecution's argument that he had controlled and directed the girls. They were as obedient in court as they had been in the victims' homes. The entire proceedings were scripted by Charlie. Every day we'd meet and he'd decide, well, today I want you each to stand up and hold your hands in some stupid symbols. You're going to get up and scream, the old gray mare. You're going to burn an X in your head. You know, each day was scripted. They would jump up in court and, and start chanting, the judge is just the woman, the judge is just the woman. Well, that was horrifying to the women in the courtroom. That was uh, seen by Charlie as the biggest insult. Throughout the trial, the giggling Manson girls seem strangely detached. Now they say that if they seemed out of touch with reality, it's because they were still living Manson's reality, taking LSD in jail and following his every word. He was talking about how time was going to stop, that we were all just going to walk out, that everyone, everything was just going to stop. And we believed that. When I went to the jail after it happened, and Leslie said to me, she didn't know whether to cut holes in the back of her blouse or sew little pockets for her wings. She thought she was an angel. I even asked Pat and Susan, how, how am I going to hide my wings? I could feel them nubbing out. The dancing clown upon the wall. Just outside of the court, the rest of the family was making a bizarre display of devotion. We're going to stay here until Charlie's out. For almost 10 months, they kept a faithful vigil, all the while weaving a vest for their guru. Like the girls inside, they mirrored Manson's every move. And with Manson in custody, it was mainly Squeaky Fromm who handled the reporters and curious crowds. They can't grab at it, you know. They just have to be patient and give. And, and it's, it's in everybody. <laughs> They said I was a spokesman. I was never a spokesman. They said I was a lieutenant. We weren't lieutenants. We didn't have, we didn't have orders. We didn't have badges. We weren't appointed anything. We did what we wanted to do. Each one of us took up what we felt we could carry, and we did it because we wanted to. If we did it because we thought it would make Charlie happy, we must have loved him or something like that. On January 25th, 1971, it came as no surprise when all four defendants, Charlie, Leslie, Pat, and Susan, were found guilty of multiple murders. And when it was time for the jury to decide whether they would live or die, the Manson girls finally took the stand. But their goal was to save Manson's life, not their own. After the trial started, Charlie suggested that we try to, we meaning the three women, try to carry the load of the case so that he could be released, you know, so that he could further carry on his works to save the world. On March 29, 1971, 21-year-old Leslie Van Houten, 22-year-old Susan Atkins, and 23-year-old Patricia Krenwinkel became the youngest women to sit on California's death row. The jury sentenced all three women and their guru to die in the gas chamber at San Quentin. I was more than willing to go to the gas chamber. The death penalty for me at the time seemed, it almost justified my not having to deal with what I had done. It was the eye for an eye. They're going to kill me. I don't have to deal with it. But away from Manson's direct influence, Leslie, Pat, and Susan would have time to reflect on the horror of their crimes. Meanwhile, 22-year-old Squeaky Fromm had lost the only family with whom she'd ever felt truly at home, and it devastated her. I didn't understand what it meant. I didn't, I didn't know that we would be separated. I want to talk to the women. I want to talk to the girls. They're still girls to me. They'll always be girls, as I am, in that one part. She felt guilty that, that they had done much more, and she hadn't. She was still free. She was not in prison. She, she was not 
facing this type of, of sacrifice that they had been called to make. While Manson and the women sat on death row, Squeaky tried to unite what was left of the family. It was an increasingly hopeless task, and guilt and grief would drive her to desperate measures. The trio of women who killed at Charles Manson's command had spent just 10 months on death row when the U.S. Supreme Court outlawed the death penalty. On February 18, 1972, Leslie, Susan, and Patricia saw their sentences reduced to life behind bars. Over the next few years, their devotion to Manson slowly soured. Really, I just think that he was just a really good con artist. I feel uh, like I was a pawn in whatever his uh, scheme was. Uh, I'm glad that I will never again have to see him. But on the outside, Lynette Squeaky Fromm stayed loyal to Manson, and she became alarmed when Pat, Leslie, and Susan began turning away from him. She would get a response from them saying, basically, look, we're the ones who are in prison, okay? We don't want to be here anymore. We want out. You know, if you're so devoted to, to Manson, what have you done lately? On September 5th, 1975, Squeaky decided it was time to prove her devotion. She strapped a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol to her leg. President Gerald Ford was visiting Sacramento that day. Ford had his hands out and was waving. He looked like cardboard to me. When Fromm drew the gun, she was quickly wrestled to the ground. But the Secret Service found no shell in the firing chamber. Squeaky said that she had never intended to fire a shot. I got two feet from him. I could have shot twice had I put the bullet in there. Her only goal, she said, was to relay a message from Manson. I said, Your Honor, the redwood trees need to be saved. They're the tallest trees in the world, and if you can't save your world's tallest trees, something's wrong. Later that year, Lynette Squeaky Fromm became the first American woman to go on trial for attempting to assassinate a president. She was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Do you have any regrets for that day? No. No, I don't. I feel it was fate. While Squeaky gave up her freedom, the other women struggled to regain theirs. Over the years in the same California prison, Leslie, Pat, and Susan have earned college degrees and held down jobs. At parole hearings, they've offered up remorseful words, even Susan, who once boasted about the killings. I know the pain and the suffering that I caused Mrs. Tate. Mrs. Frykowski, Mr. Frykowski's son, the Hinman family, the LaBianca family, I know. Nobody has to tell me, I know. She not fooling me. She was, she was not remorseful for our, uh, killing Sharon. It didn't bother her a bit. So you're gonna, you're gonna turn people like this loose on the streets? Stop to think about it. Susan Atkins been convicted of eight murders. She's been behind bars for 30 years. That's three and a half years of murder. That's not enough. How's it going, Leslie? Since 1971, only Leslie has tasted freedom. She received a retrial in 1977. That ended in a hung jury. And she was found guilty in a third trial a year later. She's still considered the most likely to be paroled. You know, I've thought, how, how, do, you, how do you even begin to rectify something as permanent as loss of life. Each time Pat comes up for parole, she says it's a struggle to live with what she did. So I was just a young woman that I killed who had parents. She was supposed to live a life, and her parents were never supposed to see her dead. Pat, Leslie, and Susan have spent 30-some years behind bars, more time than most murderers. But they believe their connection to Manson will keep them there even longer. 
he has been completely unremorseful. You have beat me, knocked my teeth out, broke my neck, drugged me with drugs, dragged me up and down hallways, prison hallways, handcuffed. This routine that he's doing now and his little clown acts on television is all part of his way of, um, I think, diminishing his own responsibility. As their hopes for parole have faded, Leslie and Pat have found strong support in each other. No one can understand what it was except we who were there. So it's like sometimes we can, we can bring to each other an awareness that another person could never attempt to because we were there. The older I get, the harder it is. Mrs. LaBianca was younger than I am now. I took away all that life. Thirty-five years later, the Manson murders continue to shock and fascinate. And the Manson women continue to pay the price for their involvement. Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten. All model prisoners have been denied parole for a combined 36 times. And although Squeaky Fromm has been eligible for parole since 1985, she has consistently waived her right to a hearing. Though the Manson women retain the right to parole reviews, legal experts are confident that the grisly nature of their crimes will keep them incarcerated for the rest of their lives. And the man behind it all, 69-year-old Charles Manson, has been denied parole 10 times. Manson's next hearing is April 2007. He remains in a state prison in California where he is locked up 23 hours a day.